everybody. Welcome to Land from Water, the ninth and final uh, conversation on architecture and land in the Americas. My name is Uche Elias. I'm the director of the Viol Center for the Study of American Architecture. The series started two years ago as a forum to learn from scholars and designers and thinkers, architects, archaeologists, who, whose work helps to clarify the implications of land and architecture. Um, our hypothesis is that land is not something that comes before architecture, but rather that architecture participates in the fabrication of land as such. Let's think of it that. The plural Americas in the title is intended to help reframe the mission of the Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture by um, reminding us that American architecture exists in uh, hemispheric and global relation with the rest of the world, and also reminding us that there are always several Americas within the United States. Uh, so before I introduce you to, to today's conversation, uh, just two pieces of Buell news. The eponymous book, which I don't have here, but there's many in the other room, uh, from in which many of the insights that we've learned over the last two years um, are collected, has been published. It was uh, launched as part of the Chicago Biennial this fall. Uh, it's available in print while supplies last and as a PDF. So if you want it, grab one over there or email us. Thank you. Beautiful book designed by Mario Otsuka. Um, so get yours, or, and if you're on Zoom, uh, email us and we'll send you one. Um, secondly, um, mark your calendars for April 12th at 5 p.m. when we will have what, what kind of a public event on the theme of architecture and abundance. Um, it's a kind of, we can call this an occasional abundance talk. I don't know, I'm working, you can call me your feedback on that title. Um, there's a scholarly project going on where, which builds on this land project, but focuses more specifically um, on the way that uh, American building landscape, building and landscape traditions have naturalized land as a bountiful commodity, and also therefore regulated the kind of inevitable counterpart, which is uh, scarcity. So uh, the two speakers will be Jennifer Truong, who will present on Benjamin Latrobe's uh, American Order, shown here in its kind of cornucopian splendor uh, on the right, and uh, our first postdoctoral Beale Fellow, more lucky, who is actually sitting right here, who I'm also announcing right now, <laughs> who will um, talk on the so-called Indian cottage planned in the late uh, 19th century. So again, and Danny Abramson will give a response. Again, Friday, April 12th, 5 p.m. Uh, okay, so let's go to today's event. Um, as you know, season three of the land series has turned our attention to the political economy of land. And of all of the elements that have kind of um, made their way into our historical explanations of the built environment and its political economy, Water is the most difficult to theorize, I would say. So take air. Uh, somehow I don't have a slide for this. Let me go back to this. Yeah. So if you take air, um, thinking about architecture and landscape as containers or conveyors of air, especially in light of climate change, has destabilized the landedness of architecture in a very specific way, which is that it has pointed us to a kind of distant causality. Air is something that points to the kind of event that where something happens in one place because of air or CO2 emitted in a completely different place. And so this distant temporality and its discreteness has led to a very specific kind of theorization of the role that air could play in the history of architecture. Or if you think about soil, and we've heard a lot about soil in this land series, um, the fact that buildings require intervention into the soil and often disturbance of soil has meant rethinking architecture's kind of situatedness, what used to be called its rootedness, in terms of you know, chemical inheritances, concepts that have been very productive from the idea of chemical kinship, for example, to also thinking of history in terms of half-lives. So very productive conceptual apparatus that we get from thinking about soil. But with water, things are not so simple. Um, so water, I would say, is more, both more victorial, it points in a very specific direction, but also more kind of complex than model. So to take our site as an example, as we do, uh, the rocks that are underneath our feet and still visible in Central Park. Uh, water is a material flow that has shaped these rocks. So if you go to Central Park and you go stand on these amazing rocks, you'll see that they're, of course, layered by geological uh, accumulation, but they're also um, marked by a striation in the other direction that happened during a very specific moment 12,000 years ago when the glacier that used to top Manhattan began to melt and move and in the process striating and you know marking the ground. So on the one hand, water is this very kind of material force. But if you're looking for how water affects patterns of settlement even today, you wouldn't say it's a material force. You would say it's more something like a haunt. So this is a map drawn from 
an article, a very nice article about the natural history of Manhattan, which shows in plan and section that what really matters is that there's a big crevice here, which means that the quality of the land and the soil along Broadway has been very specifically affected, affecting patterns of real estate and even of the clip of, uh, of urban renewal that has happened there. So there it's not so much that water is a material force, it's more kind of like a sublayer. Um, and then, of course, finally, if you go a little bit further upstate, and this is not a picture from upstate, but it is a picture of indigenous communities feeling the, the uh, toxicity of certain water that is upstream from them, um, if you, uh, you will find that water is more of a kind of subject of real politic, kind of economic, uh, something that has to be economically compensated for, because uh, indigenous communities know very well that um, uh, bound, bound land, uh, land bound boundaries meaning you know, fences that are on the ground, uh, are not much use if you are next to an industrial uh, settlement which is upstream from us. And this is in the direction in which flows have to be. There's one more spot right here. So, in order to think about all of this, we have called upon two early modernists, <laughs> Stellan Herr and Carolyn Murphy. And the reason for this is because they're going to take us to a moment just before the most recent reinvention of rivers, just before basically all over the world Plains that were just a place where rainwater collects were shaped into more or less pictorial um, lines of rivers. And when, therefore, the idea that you could shape uh, political economy and governance through water was a little bit more legible, both in discourse and in uh, the land itself. So, without further ado, let me introduce our speakers, and I'll do it in the order in which they will speak. So, to my immediate right is Stella Nett. She's a professor of indigenous art and architecture of the Americas at UCLA. Her work, I'm going to shorten your bios, I'm sorry. Go to the, our website for the very lengthy and uh, stellar bios. Um, her work is shaped by her interest in spatial practices, cultural landscapes, oral and ephemeral architecture, gender studies, construction technology, and hemispheric networks. She was trained as an architect and an architectural historian. She's published two books. The first is At Home with the Sapa Incas. The second is The Stones of Tiwanaku. Tiwanaku, thank you. Uh, and she's working on the third, and she's a much premiated scholar, so I invite you to go visit her list of uh, honors as well. Um, immediately to her right is Carolyn Murphy, who, who's an assistant professor in the history, theory, and criticism of architecture and art at MIT, um, a department with which we're very familiar. Um, her research and teaching explore the interconnected material and intellectual histories of environmental engineering, state administration, and political economy in early modern Europe and its global contact zones, her current project, from which we'll read today, focuses on the alluvial designs and planning of Italy on the eve of the Little Ice Age. I love that, Little Ice Age, primarily in Tuscany. Uh, she's also received a number of fellowships. And our respondent today is my colleague and friend, um, Atia Coricuela, who has lost her voice, so she will be very silent until she has to speak, who is, of course, an, assist an assistant professor here at Columbia GSAP. So without further ado, Stella, we're going to start with you. Um, take it away. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I've, I've, uh, of course, the Buell Center has uh, loomed large in any architect, architectural historian's life, so it's a deep honor to be invited. And so many thanks, Lucia, for having me, and Michelle for the tremendous work um, that you did to make this all happen. It's greatly appreciated. And thank you all for coming. I understand it's um, exam week. Um, is that correct? Yes, for some people. So um, thank you so much. OK. The Inca's homeland lay in the Cusco Valley, which is nestled high in the central Andean mountains. During the 15th and early 16th centuries, the Incas rapidly transformed their small city state into the largest indigenous empire in the history of the Americas, and one of the largest in the world at the time. This expansion meant that the Inca Empire incorporated a diversity of environmental zones, which ranged from high montane glaciers to the driest of deserts. It also meant that the Inca ruled over an immense number of diverse peoples, many of which were newly conquered. In order to control this vast, varied, and often challenging landscape, the Inca developed complex strategies in which architecture was used to inscribe and control their new territories physically, visually, and spiritually. The architect Graziano Gasparini and the anthropologist Luis Margolis called this built environment the Inca architecture of power. In today's paper, I will discuss how this architecture of power radically reshaped the Andes, creating new physical and conceptual maps that articulated dominance through layers of exclusion. 
My examples will draw from what is today the Departamento del Cusco in Peru. It is within this space that lay the Inca heartland, the capital of Cusco, as well as many Inca royal estates such as Machu Picchu and Chinchero. It is also within this space that we see most clearly the Inca's profound reshaping of both land and water. As Simon Shaman so eloquently described in his now classic book, Landscape and Memory, forests, mountains, and valleys embody deeper social meanings, mapping out histories, belief systems, and social dynamics. In the geographically diverse and difficult terrain of the Andes, mountains were the source of origin stories, community identities, and the basis for survival. As the Inca, Inca expanded, controlling the landscape was crucial to dominating the populace. On a practical level, the vast vertical terrain of the Andes made building and farming difficult. Therefore, earth moving projects such as terraces created much needed land for building and agriculture. While Andean peoples prior to the Inca made terraces, no one approached the Incas in quality and quantity. Inca engineering took into account underground water systems and land stability in order to create agriculturally productive lands in even the most remote places. It's hard to overstate the challenges that Inca engineers and architects faced. The Andes is the longest mountain chain in the world and the third tallest. And the Andes, like much of the Western rim of the Americas, is geologically young. Thus, the Andean mountains have deep layers of dynamic soils that have not yet been shed from the mountain's rocky core. In addition, due to melting glaciers, there are numerous rivers and streams above ground, as well as tremendous subsurface water movement below. These glaciers provide much of the water upon which Andean peoples depended and continue to, to depend for survival. The Andes also lies along the Pacific Rim of Fire, one of the most volatile and powerful earthquake zones in the world. The result is a dynamic entanglement of land, water, and movement that is difficult to harness, yet doing so is the key to survival. We can get a glimpse of these challenges facing Inca engineers and architects by looking at the royal estate of Machu Picchu. This 15th century country estate residence is often attributed to the ruler Pachacuti when he invaded and conquered this region. For the Inca, to build was an expression of power for the state and for individual rulers. The sites chosen for the royal estate <clears throat> was in a critical space where rare sight lines to multiple major apus or sacred mountains were visible. Hence, the location was a particularly potent one, albeit one that was a construction challenge. The site sits on a narrow saddle that lies between two steep mountain peaks. Two fault lines run across both ends of the saddle, and the dramatically steep landscape was prone to slides. Though there were nearby freshwater springs that were fed by melting glaciers, finding spaces suitable for building and farming would have been a challenge. Hence, the Inca had to dramatically excavate and rebuild this landscape. While there's been much attention given to the sophistication of Inca buildings, especially at Machu Picchu, these impressive structures are the only the end of a long and complex construction process. The hydraulic engineer, Kenneth Wright, and the archaeologist, Alfredo Valencia Zagara, estimate that over 60% of the labor that went into constructing Machu Picchu happened below the surface we see today. As has been confirmed by recent research, the Inca excavated deep into the mountain in order to remove unstable layers of soil and stone. They then constructed impressive terraces that redefine the mountainscape. One half of this stable new land, uh, on one half of this stable new land, the Inca created a sizable terraced farmland. And on the other, they constructed an elaborate elite complex with an array of impressive buildings that could house the ruler as well as the private and public functions associated with the royal residence. The Inca built sustainably so that ex the excess materials produced during one stage of the building process could be used in another. For example, the lithic debris resulting from the carving of building stones was used to facilitate water drainage at the site. This crushed rock was placed in distinct layers, alternating with strata of sand and eventually topsoil, in terraces and in plazas. 
Together, these layers safely percolated excess rainwater into the ground. During this process of excavation and reshaping, the Inca developed several strategies to carefully manage water above and below ground. At Machu Picchu, the Inca constructed an elaborate canal system that brought to the site fresh water from a series of natural springs, which themselves were fed by melting glaciers. The Inca canals were designed to accommodate different flow rates of water. Drainage holes and canals were laid that collected excess water from the surface and water catchment basins were made to gather and divert water away from building foundations. The Incas also made the movement of water above ground an important part of the visual and oral experience of the site, such as a series of 16 fountains that animated the royal residence in sight and sound. Hence, the complex hydraulic system that brought, brought fresh water in, gray water out, and stabilized land also <clears throat> stimulated the senses. Given that the canals of Machu Picchu were designed to carry far more than the average rainfall, and thus far beyond what was needed, it is also clear that the Inca engineers planned for an unprecedented future. 500 years later, this landscape is remarkably stable, and its extensive water system still functions today. The Inca did not describe themselves as having an empire. Instead, they saw themselves as bringing order to a disordered world. They called their land Tawantin Suyu, the land of the four Suyus, or quarters. The dramatic landscape changes at Machu Picchu was an example of this process of bringing order to a disordered space. But for the Incas, this ordering went beyond the physical to the social and the political, and they used land and water to carry out their goals. An example of this can be seen in Cusco, the Inca capital. The Inca built their capital when, where two rivers come together. In the Andes, this type of space is called a tinqui, and it is considered to be especially sacred and powerful. Only members of elite cor corporate groups called panaca could live in Cusco. Water also defines sections within the city. As the anthropologist Jeanette Shirbandi has shown, irrigation districts organized the city. A network of canals, their branches, and reservoirs defined irrigation districts within their urban core. The Inca assigned corporate groups to these districts according to their rank. Hence, the most important and powerful panaca was assigned the most valuable irrigation district. The Inca did the same with the canals in the larger Cusco Valley, with non-Inca corporate groups called Ayus. Thus, the Inca used water to define land and power. In doing so, land and water mapped out hierarchy within the city, as well as Inca authority over colonized people in the larger valley. These irrigation districts also connected much more distant Inca sites to the capital in unique ways, sites which themselves made visible Inca authority over local communities and their sacred lands and water. According to Shirbandi, two Panaca and Cusco were the most powerful, and because of this, they had the most important irrigation districts in the capital. One was Inyaka, which was associated with the ru ruler Pachacuti, the patron of Machu Picchu. They controlled the Chacan canals, uh, canals. The second was Capac, which was associated with Pachacuti's son, Tope Inca. This irrigation district drew water from Lake Piurai, which is located 20 kilometers from Cusco. An extremely long canal system called the Chinchero Ticatica was built to bring this water to Cusco, flowing directly to Capac's irrigation district. Canals such as these show how Inca power was mapped, both within the capital of Cusco and onto the larger imperial landscape. Inca corporate groups not only had rights to their irrigation districts within Cusco, but also to the lands from which their water flowed. For example, Lake Puray, which fed Tope Inca's irrigation district in Cusco, was located on the lands of his country estate, which included his royal residence at Chinchero. However, moving between the two, between the two ends of the chinchero Ticatica canal system would have been difficult for most people, since travel in the Inca empire was highly regulated in the form of roads and guard stations. To travel from Cusco to Lake Piray or to continue on to Machu Picchu meant one would have to go on an Inca highway called the Capacñan. In the Inca Empire, roads were built solely for the use of the armies and others on official Inca business. 
This was a highly effective way to control movement and repress revolt in the Inca Empire. The map shown here depicts the major highways built by the Incas. Anyone on a road without permission would be put to death, or could be put to death. When groups rose up in rebellion, the Incas, after crushing the uprising, often banished survivors to remote locations scattered across the empire. The control over travel would have ended the possibility of a collective group revolt and prevented displaced individuals from returning home. The building and control, in, and control of roads also ended traditional migrations that had been at the core of Andean mm -hmm. life. The dramatic vertical landscape that characterizes the Andes created distinct microclimates that can only grow a restricted number of crops. Therefore, in order to obtain needed supplies, families and corporate groups had to travel and sometimes live in different ecological zones. By cutting off these links, the Incas severed access to the lands and products that were crucial for survival making inhabitants even more dependent on the rich storehouses of the Incas. For colonized people or punished nobility, roads were not means of access, but became visible symbols of dispossession and displacement. The Incas were able to exert such close control of their roads, such as the one that connected Cusco to one of its major water sources at Lake Piray, with a series of tambos or way stations. Inca tambos were built along the roads to serve the purposes of supervising travel and providing a place for rest and ritual. The type of tambo built reflected the travelers it was meant to serve, such as armies, dignitaries, station guards, or messengers. One of the most important aspects of the tambo is that they had a <coughs> freshwater source for the parched travelers. Evidence suggests that there were several tambos leading to Lake Piray and other installations on Topa Inca's country estate. Pecacachu, a small terrace site on the main road to Chinchero, lies at a critical curve in the road, and it is likely an example of an Inca tambo. Modern farming has heavily destroyed the site. What remains is shown here. Travelers would not have known of its existence until they were directly upon the site and this would, be, this would be easily caught by the guards if they were traveling illegally. The size of the site indicates that it could have held a small retinue who, if granted permission, could pause for a much needed drink and, at a series of fountains whose remains are still found today. For those special few who are allowed to travel on the Inca road from Cusco to Lake Piodai, they would have come upon a very special shrine. This shrine, called Cooper Bajo today, consists of a series of curved terraces with the Inca characteristic polygonal stone masonry. But as what is most unusual about the shrine is that the Inca also built half-scale and miniature walls, the latter of which was of a multicolored polygonal masonry and is the only Inca miniature wall that survives today. According to oral history, an Ushnu or altar once stood at the top of the site all these structures are oriented towards Lake Piurai, reminding sanctioned travelers of the Inca's control over religious worship and basic subsistence needs, such as water. Lake Piurai is still a key water source to the city of Cusco today. It is important to remember that this distinctly Inca landscape with its networks <clears throat> of roads, terraces, and shrines effectively erased this lake's connection to the local non-Inca community. This built environment is an example of how the Incas reinscribed the Andes as Inca. According to the historian Maria Rostorowski de Diez Conseco, <coughs> Topa Inca built his country estate, which included Lake Piray, on the Ayamarca homeland. The Ayamarca had a long history of conflict and negotiated peace with the Inca, even eventually becoming Inca by privilege. But Topa Inca's transformation of their lands as Inca which included taking possession of land that included a much valued and venerated lake, was a clear statement of imperial Inca authority and power. <coughs> Another example of this can be seen in Topa Inca's rural residence, Chinchero, which lies very close to Lake Piurai and its shrine. Like Machu Picchu and Cusco, Chinchero was an impressive Inca rural estate set on a hillside and like Machu Picchu, the Inca builders had to extensively excavate and rebuild that hillside with terraces and a complex, with terraces and a complex above and below ground uh, hydraulic system. 
And like at Machu Picchu, large portions of earth and stone were removed from an unstable hillside in order to create a cascade of terraces, which were punctuated by a plaza and palace compound. While this allowed the, the fertile valley nearby to be farmed and created a habitable hillside, the renovations had great sacred implications as well. For many people, Pachamama, literally Earth Mother, was an important sacred force. Any action to carve into Pachamama, even for farming, required special rituals. The Incas appeared to have used this perception of the landscape to heighten their power and mystique. By transforming the landscape on a massive scale, the Incas identified themselves and became identified with sacred forces. This was used to justify their domination and reshaping of the Andes and can be seen in its connection to origin stories. For example, um, this, the Incas told the story of their first uh, Inca ancestors to arrive in the Valley of Cusco. Using a slingshot to turn mountains into plains, these Inca ancestors physically and spiritually transformed the local landscape into their sacred capital. At Chinchero, Tope Inca similarly transformed a hillside to make visible his power over the region, albeit with an immense labor force. For the Inca, making visible this connection between the Inca and nature was of paramount importance and was done in multiple ways. For example, the Inca made this connection with their choice of masonry. Many of the distinctive buildings at Machu Picchu, Cusco, and Chinchero was made with a visually striking stone masonry made of finely carved, mortarless, ashlar, and polygonal blocks. The Incas used this architectural tradition as a clearly recognizable symbol of their power and rule that dominated the newly conquered landscape. Reserved for elite Inca buildings, this distinctive architecturally to architecture visually proclaimed a site's high status to any traveler or visiting dignitary. The association of this type of architecture with Inca power can be seen in the writings of chroniclers compiled in the century after the Spanish invasion in 1532. For example, Juan de Betanzo states that Inca informants stressed that it was the Inca ruler himself who took a cord to measure and lay out important sites. And in the case of Cusco, it was the ruler who chose the stone and helped to lay the bricks. This association can also be seen in the writings and drawings of the indigenous author and artist Guaman Poma de Ayala. One of his drawings shown here depict young Inca nobles laying the distinctive ashlar blocks in an Inca wall. Stone has a long history in the Andes in terms of both the skill needed to work this challenging material, as well as the recognitions of stone's abilities to embody sacredness. Stone outcrops did, did this, um, that did this could be called waka. The importance of these sacred outcrops and mountains can be seen in the numerous way they appear in Inca origin stories, such as when one of the Inca founders became part of a sacred mountain and was worshiped. Another example is the narrative that Pachacuti, the patron of Machu Picchu, was reported to have called upon a collection of waka to, to save Cusco in a critical battle. According to this narrative, these stones transformed themselves into great warriors and defeated the invaders of the Inca capital. Once the battle was over, these temporary warriors returned back into being wakas. The Inca made the built environment to highlight their close ties to the sacred world, often by blurring the lines between what is natural and what is man-made. An example of this division and relationship can be seen at Machu Picchu. Here, to your left, um, a constructed wall appears to be more like a rocky cliff face than human construction. This union between the natural and the man-made can also be seen in the image to your right, where an Inca building is blended into a sacred outcrop. This is also at Machu Picchu. Perhaps the most potent part of, of the power of the Inca architecture power that involved both land and water is the Inca use of labor. The Inca were a relatively small community and hence had to rely on others to carry out many Inca directives. This forced delegation is especially seen in Inca architecture. The labor required to build the impressive Inca terraces at Machu Picchu, the canals in Cusco, and the shrines at Lake Piurai near Chinchero was all likely supplied by non-Inca peoples. Throughout the empire, 
Colonized populations were sent far from their homes to work as part of their labor tax for the Inca state. The Inca state depended upon its vast building projects to house the infrastructure of its rapidly growing empire. Hence, much labor was called upon to undertake these works. According to the colonial sources, 50,000 workers were constricted, constricted to build Topa Inca's residence at Chinchero. Inca technological superiority in the form of terraces and irrigation systems allowed for increased productivity, but for colonized population, it meant the loss of control over one's land, water, and labor. For the Inca, land and water were deeply entangled, forming a unit in which the Inca used in their built environment to reshape the Andes and reorganize local populations. Inca architectural gestures were not a secondary means of control, but were a critical part of state expansion and conquest. Instead of relying on brute force and defensive structures to establish Inca hierarchies of power and control, the Inca leadership manipulated land and water to exert their control. They transformed unstable and rocky hillsides to create much needed spaces to farm and build and developed advanced hydraulic systems to irrigate farmlands and provide much needed uh, fresh drinking water. But this meant that they disposed some local populations from their lands, resources, and sacred spaces, while others received access according to how the Incas ranked, how, uh, the Incas ranked them. The Inca built an extensive road system that enabled the Inca to have a quick and easy access to most places in the empire, but at the same time preventing movement for everyone else. And by using their architecture to reinscribe locally venerated places as their own, the Inca augmented their connection to the sacred while distancing those for local populations. In sum, the Inca engineered an impressive built environment that physically, conceptually, and spiritually transformed Andean land and water, and in doing so, radically reshaped the Western Rim of South America. Thank you. While we do a switch, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Am I meant to imagine the water cascading down these terraces, or is water just in the soil gradually? Yeah, it doesn't cascade. Doesn't cascade? No. It's really great because, because of the, those different layers, it actually can um, store water oh. so that it's uh, really good for farming. So it flows, but into and you don't the, have runoff problems. Into the ground, yeah. not mm -hmm. over it. Yep. Thank you for your introduction earlier, Lucia. Thank you, Stella, for the fabulous paper. Thank you, Michelle, for helping coordinate um, this event. And I look forward to the discussion after. Um, so thank you, Lucia, as well. Um, and thanks to you all for coming. So when it comes to early modern land and water infrastructures, one of the most famous examples that probably jumps to mind for architectural historians, at least in the European context, is the Canal du Midi, the monumental 150 mile long canal constructed in southern France in the late 17th century. The canal, which linked the Mediterranean Sea to the Atlantic Ocean via the Garonne River, was pitched as a strategic piece of political economic technology, an aquatic highway that could deliver to foreign markets the wheat, wine, silk, and other products harvested and produced by Languedoc's struggling farmers, while also allowing the crown to consolidate its power over this historically mutinous region. Now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the Canal du Midi is one of Europe's oldest still functioning canals, but its unlikely realization in the face of so many technical and political challenges has itself obscured a very basic fact. This canal was only one rare physical manifestation of a much older and more diffuse set of engineering ambitions. In my talk today, I'm going to bring us back in time by a century and to an altogether different place, the new ducal state of Tuscany uh, in central Italy to explore the rise of a fervent infrastructural imaginary, which reshaped how people within and without the nascent discipline of architecture began to conceive of the possibilities for the complex, often chaotic disposition of land and water. Before proceeding, I want to issue just a brief comment on my invocation of the term infrastructure. The word itself first emerged in the late 19th century to describe the preparatory works needed before laying railroad track um, in France and in Spain. It was then translated into English in the early 20th century when it came to characterize all manner of transportation projects. Responding to such, such um, usage histories, modern scholars, mostly anthropologists, 
have defined infrastructures as causal technologies, material assemblages that permit the movement of other matter, capital, and people to support economic systems. So while the word as such did not exist in early modernity, we must recognize that it's essential concept um, along with all of these functional promises, most certainly did. Starting around the second, third of the 16th century, in fact, there arose, at least in Italy, a palpable discourse about the aquatic landscape as a space that could, and most importantly should, be physically recast to advance circulation, yielding economic benefits for the Duke, the state, and its subjects. While I'll touch briefly on uh, today on some material practices of recasting rivers and wetlands in this period, um, my principal concern will remain with discourse, ideas preserved on paper, texts mostly, some of which we see on the screen here, that uh, chronicle an array of audacious in aquatic infrastructures that remained forever in the realm of the imaginary. Though never marking the landscape physically, they point to an array of futures past, which together tell us a great deal about how early modern people thought about the intersections between the improvement of water and the improvement of wealth. The first argument that I'll advance here then is that this infrastructural imaginary in Tuscany centered chiefly on the aquatic landscape's commercial affordances, how rivers and streams could be transformed into seamless passages. While this particular utility might seem like a natural one for us today, um, it was not at all in this earlier period when rivers fed industrial and domestic processes, often in competition with one another, um, as these admittedly stylized scenes from a manual on fishing and hunting evoke, uh, while also fluctuating uncontrollably themselves, uh, the, the levels of the rivers from season to season, which I'll also get to momentarily. Um, a second point I wanna make today has to do with expertise. Converting rivers into dedicated circulatory infrastructures raised a host of novel questions. How precisely should waterways be shaped? Where in the landscape could or should a canal flow? And most importantly, who should be trusted to advise on these questions? Who could be entrusted uh, to, to do it properly? I argue that as governing elites grew interested in the possibilities of reshaping aquatic landscapes at scale, the problems of water management, long the domain of uh, hydraulic engineers and architects, began to attract a host of interlopers, whom I call projectors, without hydraulic experience whatsoever. <laughs> Great idea. Um, hailing from across court and government, projectors inserted themselves forcefully into discussions um, about the future of aquatic territory, calling attention to the fact that the problems of water spilled beyond traditional domains, architecture included, and demanded uh, new strategic forms of knowledge of statecraft, politics, economics, geography, among other sundry endeavors. Before pressing on though, I wanna just take um, a few moments to sketch out the context in which this aquatic infrastructural imagination emerges in Tuscany. It came on the heels of intensified engineering activity in the wider Tuscan landscape, activity targeted at resolving an increasingly urgent problem that of flooding. While inundations had for centuries posed occasional threats to the myriad river towns and villages of central Italy, during the central decades of the 16th century, a combination of factors associated with the onset of the Little Ice Age, as historical climatologists call it, um, resulted in more <clears throat> frequent and catastrophic flood events with an elevated toll on life and property. Um, here on the right, juxtaposed with an Arno River flood map from the mid 16th century, um, I'm showing you Florence, Tuscany's capital, under flood waters in the 1966 flood, um, which by all accounts was the worst since the 16th century, probably since 1557. With almost every inundation that swept through Tuscany, but especially through Florence, the Medicean government took action in an attempt to mitigate such disasters in the future. In August 1547, for example, on the heels of a particularly bad flood memorialized here in the urban fabric with a flood marker, um, which is about my height uh, when I'm standing, the ducal government issued a slew of legislation meant to protect rivers and stabilize riparian spaces. Then two years later, in 1549, 
it founded a new specialized rivers management office called the Ufficiali dei Fiumi, literally the officials of the rivers. Staffed with practically trained engineers, as well as bricklayers, carpenters, and stonemasons who had cut their teeth in urban work sites, as well as on ducal villa, garden, and fountain projects, the jurisdiction of this rivers office extended across the duchy's dominions. Working along uh, a modest stretch only of the state's principal Arno River, from the towns of San Giovanni Valdarno to the Gonfolina, seen here, this office engaged the maintenance engaged the, in the maintenance and repair of flood defense structures, which ranged from timber posts pounded vertically into sandy shorelines to earthen and reed embankments to gabion structures assembled from rope and stone. Beyond this modest space, though, uh, the office, for the most part, delegated tasks of alluvial defense and engineering to towns and private landowners by merely enforcing and policing much older riparian laws, some going back to ancient Rome, um, and punishing those who violated them. In the end, these working methods, um, as I argue elsewhere, were not all that novel, pursued as they were by earlier public works offices in the state. But they were also reactive, relying on subjects, as I mentioned, to duly note problems in a timely manner. But over the course of a couple of decades, the Ufficiali dei Fiumi gradually begin to revise their practices, engaging in more proactive methods of flood mitigation and expanding the scope of their territory forming interventions, to make a very long story quite short. Um, and it's in this context, starting around the year 1570, that projectors begin to arrive on the scene. Appealing to the Duke for honors and patronage, they wrote about the deficiencies they perceived in the landscape <clears throat> and made audacious proposals for how they should be rectified. Now, projectors often dubbed their ideas imprese, an Italian word that means sort of enterprises, but also called them lavori, or works, and my favorite, disegni, or designs, so the landscape, they're literally thinking about designing it. Typically, these proposals took flood containment as their pretext before outlining other plans for recasting the landscape to improve commercial circulation, among other economic benefits. The clustering of benefits was, as we'll see, a characteristic rhetorical move that projectors made in a bid to sell potential patrons on their plans. So was treating aquatic territory as a tabula rasa, an endlessly pliable space bounded only by the limits of human imagination. In the time remaining, to give you a fuller sense of the, the texture of this infrastructural imaginary, I want to walk you in detail through just one early and particularly articulate example of a project, a text from 1568 titled A Discourse on the Reclamation of the Pisan Plains, written by the Florentine patrician and bureaucrat Lorenzo Albizzi. Part of the reason why this project is so rich is because Albizzi wrote it as a dialogue. In the 16th century, uh, this was a literary, essentially fictional format, one that allowed an author to explore multiple points of view by dele delegating them to various characters in conversation. In this text, however, Albizzi's fictional protagonists um, are real people who are named. Um, one is himself, and the other is the ducal architect Davide Fortini, who was a technician in the Ufficiali dei Fiumi, as well as Giovanni di Alessandro Caccini, then superintendent of a similar rivers office that was founded in Pisa. Now, because Albizzi is known and remembered today by historians, principally for this dialogue, he is usually described as a hydraulic architect. But I reconstructed his biography based on many other sources, and I found little evidence that he actually ever worked in this capacity. <laughs> so instead, he would have composed this dialogue on the Pisan Plains in 1568, after a period stationed in this region, first as a territorial administrator in the mountain town of Barga on the top of the screen, and then as a treasurer um, to the Duke's brother, Giovanni di Cosimo de' Medici, who was then uh, working as the Archbishop of Pisa. While serving out these roles, it's plausible that he became familiar with the landscapes of Western Tuscany, it, its flood problems and its potentials for improvement. He probably got some ideas of his own. It's also possible that he met the flesh and blood Fortini and Caccini, his fictional interlocutors while he was in Pisa, since they were working on ducal building and river projects there at the time. <clears throat> 
These latter two were also among the Duke's most favored um, technicians and administrators, as well as very well recognized experts on alluvial matters. Albizzi's title announces his ostensible subject, the cessation of floods in Pisa and the drainage of its coastal marshlands. But as the dialogue unfolds, his focus on disaster mitigation gives way to a much grander set of transformations that involve straightening, diverting, and channeling the region's rivers into commercial infrastructures to better interconnect the alternately hilly, swampy, and craggy terrain. Albizzi's proposals are too numerous to name here, but culminated in the following principal gestures. First, cutting the Circhio River near the town of Ivane. Um, Circhio up here. So um, apologies about the um, legend, which got a little cut off, but the, the blue uh, line will be the Circhio and the red is the Arno and then Albizzi's plan. Um, or sorry, the Circhio is on the top. Um, Albizzi's plan is in the thick red and the Arno, the existing sort of um, trace of it, um, is below. Um, sorry about this uh, on the screen. So Albizzi's proposals um, started with cutting the Circhio River near the town of Avane, second, filling the marshes of Nautica and Vecchiano and the lake of Massachusetts with its sediments, while also cutting a diversion outlet to feed into and augment the Canale di Riva Frata, um, which I'll show you in a second. Then in dramatic fashion, moving the Arno from Pisa by turning its course south to Pontedera to fill in the marshes of Stagno below, before turning northwards to join back up uh, with the Bientina and down through the Canale of Usciana to fill in the Arno's former bed. These operations, which coalesce around the Sergio River and its surrounding plains and mountains, display Albizzi's keen interest in developing Western and Upper Tuscany, the site of quarries, mines, and silk mills, and in bringing these regions into more reliable communication with the rest of the state. Um, and as an aside, it's interesting to note that while the duchy was beginning to develop the port of Livorno at this time to replace the Porto Pisano, which was silting in, it appears that this larger reorientation uh, did not register for Albizzi. It was um, not yet apparent to him. When he was in Pisa, this was again still very much in its infancy, and so it points to this kind of alternative future, this alternative economic plan that was never, never realized. Now, as Albizzi unfolds his vision for this space, Caccini and Fortini repeatedly challenge him. Skeptical about the technical feasibility of his scheme, they pepper him with questions about the risks and ramifications of his interventions. In response, Albizzi tries to persuade them to see his way, insistently justifying his infrastructural ideas, very utopian, in the light of their effectiveness at preventing floods, while also delivering a host of other economic benefits, especially the advancement of commercial exchange. Um, so I'll touch on just a few examples to, to illustrate this dynamic. After suggesting slight tweaks to the Sergio River, Albizzi thinks carefully about the best way to repair an artificial drainage channel around <clears throat> Pisa. Many of these, um, such as the Ripa Frata shown here, were losing water from evaporation in the summer and silt accumulation, inhibiting navigation and the reliable discharge of swampy waters. Albizzi also complained of their stench, citing bad vapors in the summer. To improve these channels, he proposes diverting them uh, into them more water from the Circhio. Beyond removing the stink, he said, this operation would supply um, it connected irrigation channels, support industrial milling, and restore easy navigation between Lucca and Pisa, such that merchants could, and I quote, retrieve grain and other merchandise from that city. The commercial and infrastructural uses of these channels, all connected together, interested Albizzi greatly, but Caccini and Fortini doubted his plans, fearing that the Sergio could not supply all the water necessary to surface all of these myriad functions. Albizzi's next infrastructural proposition was incredibly bold and met with substantial resistance. He declared that to liberate Pisa from floods, it would be, and I quote, necessary to remove the Arno such that it does not pass by Pisa, not even within a few miles. Fortini instantly challenged the suggestion, stating that, quote, the customs and the businesses would all come to nothing. Albizzi replied that he'd move the Circhio to Pisa anyways, replacing one river with another to ensure no harm to the city's <laughs> commerce. 
To emphasize his sincerity, Albizzi even invoked as a foil the infamous example Vitruvius made in his De Architectura of the Macedonian architect Dinocratis of Rhodes in devising a city on the slopes of Mount Athos for Alexander the Great. Dinocratis, as Vitruvius tells it, neglected to consider basic practicalities such as access to water and farm fields. Distancing himself from this egregious offense, Albizzi insisted that he did not wish to say it like that architect, for he had thought about whence to get sufficient water to enable navigation. Albizzi's underlying interest in the infrastructural viability of Tuscany's landscape perhaps comes into sharpest relief when he goes beyond discussing merely alluvial cutting to suggest what he calls his caprice or his fantastical idea to uh, tunnel a passage through the mountains by the town of San Giuliano, eight kilometers north northwest of Pisa. This feat would, and I quote, create a convenience for travelers because the mountain street, while not that long, is very disastrous and steep. In dialogue with Caccini and Fortini, Albizzi discussed creating a two-way carriage track to speed commerce between Lucca and Pisa, which he also imagined as a toll route to raise funds for ducal coffers. He suggested putting soil and stones quarried from the tunnel to use for other building purposes and teased that, quote, perhaps one could find in the body of this mountain something of such importance that the cost would not be without evident profit. So he's alluding here to some sort of gold mining or some other sort of metal. Um, for Albizzi, the project was quite literally an investment, one whose difficulty and expense were more than justified by its commodity and utility. Convinced at last of the merits of Albizzi's infrastructural promises, Fortini and Caccini compliment him on his valiant spirit. Their exchange just thus draws to a close and its protagonists bid farewell, committing to discuss improvements to the marshlands of the Val di Chiana, another marsh, uh, and Siena upon their next meeting. And I have not found any evidence of this discussion, so their, their conclusions remain a mystery. <clears throat> By successfully persuading the skeptical Caccini and Fortini of the benefits of his circulatory plan, the flesh and blood Albizzi could assert that he deserved the earnest consideration of his ducal readers in the real world. At a time when it was impossible to test or model the hydraulic effects of vast terraforming enterprises and to know in advance whether an, such an enterprise would succeed or fail, the approval of cautious, reputable technicians probably counted for a lot. The social and professional contest that unfolds in this text between Caccini, Albizzi, and Fortini, then, is as central to its drama as are his audacious proposals for transforming Pisa's aquatic territory into a seamlessly navigable infrastructure network, and they together in tandem give meaning to this text. While Albizzi was somewhat unique among his fellow projectors in presenting his ideas as a dialogue, others also alluded to the fraught questions of expertise subtending grand enterprises of commercial infrastructure. For example, in his 1591 proposal for draining the Val di Chiana and channeling its waters into a navigable canal, the scholar and territorial governor Giovanni Rondinelli preemptively addressed the doubt that some have about the viability of his scheme. While some feared that draining the valley would flood Florence, Rondinelli insisted that he had carefully considered this risk, asserting that, for more and very clear reasons, I do not believe it. <laughs> a few years later, the noble and prelate Baldessare Nardi also turned his mind to the drainage and channeling of this valley, writing to promote this enterprise and disarm detractors who feared it would cause flood surges in Rome. Some projectors even came to Tuscany from other parts of Europe. In the 1570s, the Flemish engineer Willem de Rat promised Duke Francesco de' Medici a model of an audacious canal to straighten the Arno River completely so as to facilitate transit from Florence to the sea without the arduous work of transshipment. And so in this way, as the city gave way to the territory as the principal site of government reflection and action under new increasingly powerful rulers in Italy and in other parts of Europe during the early modern period, a widening circle of experts treated the planning of land and water as a matter of conscious and deliberate forethought, a design problem aimed at generating state wealth. As we have seen, the Promethean transformations of unruly waters into commercial infrastructures could only be dreamt in Tuscany um, 
uh, after it had grown more capable of administering its rivers in practice on the ground. But it became a necessary dream, importantly, as the state adapted to a host of related political and economic conjunctures, inflationary pressures for one, along with Tuscany's general turn toward internal development, once its subjugation to Spain largely foreclosed any hopes of overseas expansion. Projectors seized on these complex issues of land and water, ones that flowed far beyond architecture and that expanded its remit in the process. Thank you. Thank you for the fascinating papers. Uh, Stella, I'll start with your papers since you read first and then Caroline, I have some questions for you too. Okay. Stella, your big making <clears throat> <laughs> Probably not. Your paper made me think about a tension in interpreting certain kinds of urban fabrics or certain kinds of civilizational fabrics, uh, which, which is that on the one hand, you can provide a kind of materialist explanation that these are these royal landed estates that are uh, these land royal land estates are an artifact of a surplus economy. Uh, and that we can mobilize people away from agriculture to participate in construction, pay wages, build armies. Alternately, there's a cultural explanation in the sense that these landscapes are built on uh, to reflect sacred landscapes and model themselves on it. It seemed to me while reading the paper that I read uh, that the, there's a tension, uh, this tension between agricultural product productivity as reshaping the land uh, as a, into a sacred landscape dismantles this easy dichotomy between the sacred and materialist explanations. And I was thinking here of your story of the royal estate of Buena Kapak, the grandson of Pachakuti, who transformed the marshland into a canalized and lush productive region. And you describe the impetus for this project, uh, you describe the impetus for this project as being religious significance of humans bringing order to disordered and chaotic nature. And then additionally, Speaking of the transformations inaugurated by Topa Inca on his landed estate, you also talk about how this reveals a kind of like it brings forth this sacred landscape in the sense that there's a network of shrines and stones and ancestral sites that are not only avoided by the engineering project, but are kind of incorporated into it. Um, here the example is of the road that cut above the Urkus, um, land. Um, so my question here is that in terms of the Chinchero people's everyday lives, is there a kind of network of pilgrimage? Like in what way did pilgrimage play a role in um, me, in how this sacred landscape intersected with the kind of engineering landscape, mm -hmm. you know, that these two kind of come together in this interesting way? Um, okay, so that's my first question. And then I have another question, which is how was engineering bureaucratized? and then finance to make this long-term project because or both of the projects that you're describing, they're very long-term projects. So they involve not just the construction of them, but also the maintenance and the renewal of them. And so, you know, um, what kind of administrative hierarchies had to be developed and maintained mm -hmm. to manage these roads, terraces, mm -hmm. outcrops, canals, and how was maintenance and renewal baked into the cosmology of engineering? Mm -hmm. Okay. And my last question, which I think is uh, one of the kind of most weird ones in the sense of difficult ones, is the status of marshlands. Mm -hmm. So the most interesting feature, one of the most interesting feature of the story in relation to this uh, question of land and water is the marshland, mm -hmm. because it counters that kind of neat boundary of land versus water, mm -hmm. right? It's neither land nor water. <clears throat> Um, and much of the recent critique of colonial engineering projects has been that they were managing that boundary between land and water and that this boundary management um, created, uh, first of all, it created those distinct categories of land and water, but then it had all of these different legal ramifications and environmental outcomes because that boundary had to be fixed. It could no longer be imagined as a moving boundary. So colonial engineering to that extent could not conceive of the flood as part of the process of mm -hmm. renewal. And so uh, the question here is that, is the drained marshland, can you think, do you think of it or can we, is, is the only way to think of it as a kind of engineering embodiment of a strong central and authoritarian power? Mm -hmm. um, what does the, uh, why does this marshland occupy this liminal mm -hmm. space and how can we theorize it from this perspective of land, property, and agriculture, mm -hmm. which, which you know, doesn't kind of fit with the marshland? 
Um, and you know, when I was looking at your slides, um, one of the things I noted, I remembered, is that one of James Scott's central arguments is that the mountains are the space of resistance and retreat. Mm -hmm. They are not, and so it's so interesting that here you have a counter example, right? Mm -hmm. Of the mountain actually as a, a space of managing people's bodies mm -hmm. and inserting authority into this kind of mm -hmm. space. So uh, that was just a thought, I don't have a question about that. Um, what should we do? Should... No, I think you should take the answers, no? Okay. Yes, sure. Or do you want to ask? Um, all them? questions? Yeah. Okay, ask away. All right, all right. I'll, I'll <laughs> comment away. Comment away. Okay, so Caroline, thank you. Yeah, that's also a good point. <laughs> Great question. Thank you. Um, thank you for your very exciting paper. So, your paper delves into this process by which political elites in Florence created the political and technical conditions for the canalization of the Arno River. Um, and the story is, an, is, is expansive in how it draws in these multiple spheres of public life, finance, government, engineering, labor, <laughs> aesthetics. So I have a couple of observations about your paper and some questions, which will hopefully uh, give, also give you a chance to bring the bigger project, you know, that I skimmed more than that <laughs> into. <laughs> no, it was really fun. Uh, one of the points you make is that this endeavor produced a kind of hegemony or consensus among uh, the political elite in uh, class in Florence in terms of the sweeping legislation that they passed that inaugurated this long-term process of transforming land. So given how long this kind of pro project is, you know, it's not, you, one can't even consider it to be one thing, right? It's a series of projects um, and something that had to happen under multiple successive governments. And so, uh, the reason I'm asking this question is to flip that received understanding of what transpired. So, some, you know, one kind of way to think of this is that there's this, um, how do you say, duchy, the duchy, duchy that transforms the land and the river. But then the other way to think about it is that um, it is in creating this land that the ducal state itself gets transformed. Mm -hmm. So could you maybe speak to this as to how the state changed as a result of the physical and geographical transformation? So the second question I have is that this project required a vast form of geographical knowledge, things like what kind of clay deposits or stone deposits one could tap into to build these um, earthworks. It required an understanding of water logging. Uh, it required the development of new technical expertise, mathematics, not only of fluid motion, but to calculate the volume of water in each river. Um, so what prior knowledge or older institutional forms of engineering, treaties on geology, geography, meteorolo meteorology, and I say that word very specifically because that's my 19th century colonial India brain trying to figure out pathways into the 16th century, you know, Italian world. Absolutely. Like what are these, what are the institutional forms of architecture and engineering that made the project thinkable, you know, that came before the project? So as a variation on that question, you have this, uh, which you didn't show today, but um, is in, it was in your earlier paper, which is Da Vinci's intervention, yes. you know, the drawings for canals and we, and, and I- back up slide. Uh, That's what you meant. Yeah. 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 And then so, I, when, I did, when I was sort of looking for other images of this, he's also designed weirs. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so this is, these, are, these are very concrete interventions <clears throat> that he's proposing. Uh, they're not just, you know, ideas. Yeah. Um, so the question is, you know, you make a, you, your case, the, the case you make is that it was the floods. If the floods hadn't happened, they wouldn't have done this. I'm a little suspicious of that. Mm -hmm. I think that there may be more things that bring ideas that are already floating into political reality. And so I wanted to sort of maybe a little bit push you on that to figure out, you know, what are some of the other political rather than, you know, because it's a very, um, that, that it all falls on this flood, the, this sort of, external event that makes this a possibility. I was wondering if you had any thoughts over there. Yeah. So on that subject, you offer this definition of infrastructure, you know, and I, I quoted it here, anthropologists define infrastructures as causal technologies, material assemblages that permit the movement of other matters. And this is a very material definition of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other ways to think about infrastructure, which is that it is a state making project. You know, so political hegemony, hegemony doesn't produce the project, rather the project produces hegemony and consensus. Um, and so, yeah, that's 
I don't know where the question was, it was there somewhere. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> and then my final question is about the finances involved in this undertaking. Is there a way that um, the Florentine state had to produce new forms of debt, leveraging future financial possibilities? And I think you came close to talking about it when you talked about convincing patrons to invest in projects. Um, so, so, you know, this is akin to kind of the auxiliary economic benefits that you were talking mm -hmm. about. So how did this project appreciably transform Florentine financial structures of either taxation or credit, you know? And here, of course, um, uh, it was interesting because LBC was, was the treasurer. Yeah. So yeah. that to me speaks to how a certain kind of financial incentive comes before the engineering incentive, yes. you know, so that I don't know, that might be one way to think about it. Um, okay, and then one final kind of question for both of you that you know, you don't have to or you could choose to answer. So you use this word, two words, infrastructure, and then the phrase environmental crisis, which are somewhat anachronistic to build your argument to interrogate, you know, territorial design in Florence. And Stella, your project deals with similar geographical and geological interventions, but you stay away from those words. You know, you're very careful about the words you use. Uh, they're not anachronistic in this way. Uh, so, given this, uh, given this kind of very fertile and prolific new academic work theorizing the Anthropocene, mm -hmm. my question to you is: Do you find that language or that kind of new interest? helpful or useful or unhelpful like how do you interact with that given uh, how have these new you know emerging critiques shaped your work you know historical work um which which doesn't speak to it in a one is to one way but is clearly emerging from that kind of new interest okay that's it thank you thank you And the voice came back. Yeah, came back. <laughs> the more I spoke, yeah. the speaking <laughs> makes the voice, yeah. not the voice that makes the voice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question. yes, and, and let me know if I get off track from your original questions. My handwriting is terrible. Um, but uh, the first question was about uh, the practices sort of of the local and the everyday, and then this imposition of the state. And a couple of thoughts. One is the Incas have different relationships in their expansion. So they're right, we're very well known for some pretty uh, violent military encounters. Um, but a lot of their expansion happened because of negotiated settlement. So, you know, going in and saying, hey, you know, we could go to war or, you know, we can have an agreement here. And in, in places like that, there's, there's a lot of variety of um, considerable autonomy within those places. And the Incas are also really well known for adapting how they administer according to what best suits that. So like using the decimal system, like Titicaca, not using it in yeah. the north. Mm -hmm. And so there's, um, in other words, there's some situations you can imagine that local populations had a lot of access still to those spaces. And then you see where those violent encounters happen and you see it in the architecture because it's very standard classic Inca. And in those areas where you have the negotiated ones, you have a lot of local architectural influences in the Inca architecture, which is really quite fascinating, which really shows how they see architecture as making visible those relationships. But I really love the idea also just thinking about the everyday because I think a problem that we have when we look at the Incas, we're getting largely their narratives as you know, then obviously the Spanish, but who's being interviewed are Incas if they're indigenous, with the exception of people like Guam and Poma, who's not Inca, um, and that we can buy into that state narrative and not um, obviously all of these colonized uh, peoples. But um, Sabina McCormack in her writing about the early colonial period talked about how what a problem it was for um, European uh, priests who are trying to Christianize because, uh, quote, the countryside remains pagan. Because there's so many act, the ways that you inter interact in your everyday life that have sacred implications. It's not something that can be readily uh, eliminated. And it's that act of the everyday in which those relationships are constantly being reinscribed. So the Incas would have had a similar issue with that, right? Even those, those tight encounters. Did that address that first question? Okay. Um, and then the other one, I love the question on maintenance because, you know, 
construction is my favorite thing. But this also is really, really key because there is this issue with we see stone architecture, you know, oh, look at Machu Picchu is still there. You just build it and it stands, right? Like the, it completely erases, and, and Carolyn is doing this uh, uh, wonderful SAH session on construction zones um, at the SAH. Um, but this is key, right? This is, there. there is a lot of which we don't see that would have been part of Inca architecture that would have constantly been maintained. Um, so that actually had to happen, but this also would have felt uh, um, still been very much part of that Inca oversight and maintenance because like in Chinchero, apparently, you know, Topa Inca supposedly um, says, you know, I want to build this and he calls these nobles and says, okay, you all are going to do this for me. And then they call their next people who call up other people. And so there's, you're, you're reiterating the whole hierarchy and every time maintenance has to happen, right? You're going to have that whole, the Inca order being replaced again and again. So maintenance is really, really key. And of course, relationships to the environment. Um, you, you see this also very nicely planned out. Um, <clears throat> so the marshlands, I'm glad you brought up Wanakapa because I had to cut it from this talk, which was hard because it's such a fascinating example. We, we sent in long, longer talks than what we gave. So you saw Pachacuti had uh, Machu Picchu, his son uh, Topa Inca uh, had Chinchero, and the grandson is Wanakapa. And he comes to power and sort of because of his mom. Um, and so he's, he's not really, he comes with great doubt. Right, that he should really be the ruler. And um, it's a big chip on his shoulder, and you see this in the architecture he makes. He sort of makes what we would in the 80s have called big mansions. Um, things are really out of proportion. But he wants to have, so most Incas build in what today we call the Sacred Valley. Um, and there was not a lot of land left except this marshland. And what he does is, or his architects and engineers do, is they, they transform that marshland into agricultural land. And it's actually became one of the richest agricultural lands in the entire Sacred Valley. So it's a completely different use of water and land mm -hmm. than what you saw with Pachacuti. But this is also typical of Inca architecture. It's incredibly context specific, whether it's the landscape, but also what are the, the, the actions at that site and the relationship with that environment and those local people and the specific political context. So it's a really great example of how land and water could easily adapt to those. Um, he, a, a thing also to understand in that is when a ruler comes to be, if they don't have progenitor, so, um, and they had a lot of children, Pachacuti's rumored to have 300. Um, needless to say, more than one wife. Um, but when, when, a ruler came, when a ruler came to be, um, they inherited the title and the power, but no wealth. And in the Andes, you have Aini, reciprocity. And so to get something, you have to have something to give, which encourages rulers to go out and conquer new lands, um, because a ruler would get portions of those lands uh, for themselves as, as they went out, but farmland's key, right? You have to be growing a diversity of things so that you can say, here, I can exchange that. So for Juana Kapak, um, <clears throat> having farmland would have been very important, but you raise a really important issue about how marshlands would have been understood. And in the Andes, there's a lot about um, sort of that coming together of things. Mm -hmm. Um, like they have gender, everything in the world is ordered according to gendered pairs, but they also have gender fluidity. So one thing that is paired in one situation it is male, and then in another situation that same thing when paired with something else is female, and then everybody has multiple genders within it. And so it's a long way of saying, I don't know how <laughs> marshlands in particular were looked at, but I, I, I now want to look because I feel like that has to be uh, one of these really sort of liminal examples. So thank you for that great question. Um, and then the final thing was on language. So just quickly, um, you know, I think for all of us doing indigenous studies, the key is to try and go to indigenous concepts and therefore language is really, really critical. Like I'm really trying to figure out 
um, how to think about what's the vocabulary that the Incas used to describe what they were doing because it's, you know, I say empire because it's easier just to sort of convey that um, with this talk, but as I'm writing my own work, it's trying to think of, because this whole idea of order and disorder, I think is really central. So um, I am exploring language and I do think, and I do like that it's, we're being sort of opened up and challenged um, about this with this new critique. So thank you. Great. Um, thank you. That was fascinating, Stella, and I look forward to asking further questions after. Um, thank you, Atiyah. These are wonderful questions. And um, again, direct me if I'm um, getting off course. Channel this, uh, you know, <laughs> the channel the river. Um, so the first question um, pertained to sort of this question of how is the state constructed, um, and is it right to sort of say that it existed before? or is it being produced through the processes of engineering? And that's an excellent question. And what I'll say is, um, I think a new kind of state is coming into being. So there is a state before, I mean, the concept of the state is ancient and Florentines are very much, um, you know, speaking of their political community as a state and um, had for centuries. Um, what they're trying to do here is establish a new territorial one. Um, and that is particular to the Florentine context, but it's also um, representative of wider um, forces ongoing in Europe at this moment. Um, in the Florentine one, which I'll just speak to briefly, um, and I think this might sort of point to answers of some other questions. Um, Italy, um, Central Italy was a patchwork of these tiny towns that were conquering smaller outlying towns and villages um, over the course of the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. Um, and as this is happening, they have to learn how to how to govern that bigger space. And this results in um, a, a realized need for new techniques of policing, governance, et cetera. And so and on the one hand, these projects are only possible once that jurisdiction is at least um, de jure, sort of Florence's. But in practice, this remains still a, a new challenge. And so um, what is happening in the 16th century after the duchy forms, the duchy forms, um, in the 1530, uh, 1530s through 1540s, 1550 is a year of many, many different um, administrative and legislative reforms, um, and also a point in time when external threats to the state, um, it was sort of being besieged um, very violently um, in the 30s and 40s. All of these threats sort of go away, and there's now sort of a turn toward internal development. And so, in short, the state is making itself um, in a new way, and this territorial push is very key to that. And they sort of reach to different ancient precedents. They reach to, um, as I was talking about with Stella earlier, eventually they sort of look abroad for precedents of, of non-European empires that sort of start to become um, meaningful to them as, as models to aspire to. So um, the state is, is always in a process of making itself, I think and crisis to sort of jump to that question about flood crisis. Um, that is obviously a sort of modern term, but um, this question that you asked Stella about order and disorder um, is also very operative in this context too. And so they are always talking about floods as disorders and I'm, I'm writing on this right now. Um, and so this, if they didn't have the word crisis, they certainly had the word um, disorder and they were describing these events in this, in this manner. Um, and then to sort of, continue on that on that question. Um, so I think floods were one sort of productive element in this um, push toward engineering its landscapes and territories, um, but it's not the only one. And I didn't get to that wider context today, but um, floods are happening at a very key inflection point in the state's history and in its efforts to transform itself into a territorial monarchy. Um, and it's because of what I just mentioned about how um, Florence was a republic that made itself into a state under the Medici regime. It was a republic for um, several centuries, and suddenly they have this du this duke that is acting as a monarch, and that has to be legitimated. And this is seen through centuries of Florentine um, political writing as something that might be illegitimate. And so part of the sort of way in which um, the Medici and dukes seek to legitimate the right to rule is by <clears throat> fashioning themselves as good rulers with care for the common good, and floods are things that um, sort of harm that very, very obviously. And people talk about this, rulers talk about this, and it becomes um, something that is even equated to external enemies. And so I've seen writers in the late 16th century 
talking about um, marshlands and floods as uh, the same thing as unruly soldiers. And so that, I mean, that meant a lot for these people. So um, that is sort of why I think the flood is not the only cause of these, um, it's not the only impetus for terraforming in this time period. And I should also say, none of this is strictly new. I mean, I have Leonardo da Vinci on the screen here. Um, these sorts of activities were ongoing on a smaller scale. Every town was trying to make sure the river was useful. It was vital to economic life. Um, before they had hydraulic engineers doing this work, they actually entrusted priests often with these tasks as they were seen as trustworthy. Um, and so like expertise shifts uh, tremendously over the course of the Middle Ages and early modern period uh, when it comes to water management. But um, this, what is new is not that it happens, it's the scale on which it happens. Um, and Leonardo da Vinci sort of troubles my timeline a bit. Uh, of course, we'll, we'll let him, uh, he, is, he is remarkable. Um, but this is one, one sort of rare example of such an audacious plan, what's new from the second half of the 16th century is the, the proliferation of it. Um, and it's sort of um, the, the massive scale with which these projects are sort of being proposed, but also the fact that these interlopers, um, I, I was sort of always thinking about these figures as interlopers. Um, and then Vera Keller, who has written um, beautifully on projectors in the Anglophone world, um, in the English context, just published a book um, called The Interlopers, and it's about projectors. So um, we're, we're on the same wavelength. <laughs> but uh, I mean, this figure has, it's a well-known epistemic character in, in the German and the English contexts in the early modern period. Um, I, I don't know a tremendous amount uh, about any, I, I haven't seen any literature sort of also pegging these figures um, in Southern European and in Italian context, but certainly they were there. So um, this is sort of the discourse I'm trying to tap into. Um, and I think it's also meaningful that we don't, like, I mean, I was showing you all texts because these guys are treasurers, like they're not drawing necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and drawing and mapping itself pr proliferate from the middle 16th century, mm -hmm. partly because the state um, is, is seeking to sort of control its landscapes mm -hmm. more than they were before. Mm -hmm. they're, bureaucratizing at an intensive pace. Mm -hmm. um, and so while you have sort of isolated figures like Leonardo da Vinci, I mean, and not isolated, their architects are drawing, architectural drawing becomes very sort of standardized from the late 14th, early 15th centuries. Um, but sort of the question of how to draw a river, how to represent a landscape, these are still new problems. Um, and so these projectors I showed today, they're all writing um, and sort of talking about geography, not drawing it. Um, and so, in terms of, let me just try to see what other question I'm missing. Can I attach a question? Yeah. The last question is a kind of joint one, so mine will be smaller, but the way in which uh, Abizzi calls it bonificare. Yeah. Make oh, better. Yes. So yes. is that, am I allowed to read improvement? I uh, yeah. uh, sort of tentatively um, argued so, and I need to sort of like bolster this. Right. So I'd love to chat with you about that. Well, after because you the translated it as yeah. something very technical. You said yeah. desiccate. I mean, they also use, the other they, people it, do it desiccate. Used, yes. And yeah. you said, drain but really what they mean is improve the land mm -hmm. no? yes it's it's it, it's often translated today as reclaim like bonificare yes, but, but improvement is a discourse that is so because bonificare really really means to make good which is the same yes. as improvement improvement yes. means you make it make money make it, basically so. yeah yeah and it's true i mean that tells you how they saw swamps right. as 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 not good, not good right. <laughs> yeah yeah so i think it is key to this and I am trying to sort of find more examples of this um, because I've looked at the historical etymology and in certain contexts it does mean this and I, I, I want to sort of see when that came in to be used to describe these projects. Um, but it's in everything from the sort of political literature to the projectors texts to the writings of engineers working for the ducal bureaucracies. Um, and then in terms of, Etienne, you had also asked about the... We can also open it. Oh, yeah. 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 So yeah. The question about the, like... because the last question you gave, which was yeah. the translation oh, yeah. the language, the, the willingness of new historiographic concepts and language yes, to yeah, be projected fabulous. back into this early modern period. Mm -hmm. So say something about yeah. that and then we'll open it up to you. Oh, it's a question I get a lot and mm -hmm. um, I have struggled with it a, a little bit. Um, I was very tentative and hesitant to sort of think about infrastructure for this period at first. Um, but, you know, we always use words to talk about things in the past in, this, in, in different ways. Um, this is, I'm not trying to be like coy, I think, you know, um, there was there was an idea about the importance of moving things from place to place um, in a way that sort of captures a post-structuralist idea of infrastructure, and it's it's useful to sort of bring people in and sort of help them to understand the concept, um, but also to sort of get at the 
nexus um, between space, materiality, movement, and, and political economy that is central to debates about infrastructure today. So um, for that reason, yeah. I, I don't in any way object oh, no, 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 to where no, no, you, no. you know, oh, just yeah. to, no. it's more to it's understand. A, I need to figure how... out a good way to answer it because everyone always asks and it's yeah. like an amazing and proper question, yeah. But other than that, the question is also how does this new kind of set of theorizing become useful yeah. for, for us? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's an excellent question. I mean, I was writing a lot of this during COVID when our movement was sort of um, drastically halted and it, it sort of made apparent what the sort of struggle uh, in, in certain ways it, it sort of peeled back the naturalized conditions about our spaces and our political societies that we sort of have taken for granted and not, I mean not evenly of course. Um, uh, uh, I. I think this gets to a bigger question about you know this time period too. maybe Stella you can speak to this is the 16th century pre-modern is it like early modern mm -hmm. is it renaissance and I mean I I one sort of point I want to make is I, I think a lot of these practices are typically pegged on a later period mm -hmm. so people don't sort of often think about the early modern period as a time when you have these grand terraforming enterprises but, but you did mm -hmm. um, it's not sort of purely an 18th century post 18th century mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. um, and so part of my reason for using that is to simply sort of make that clear. Um, it's, it's very intentional, but um, I, the work I'm trying to do now is to think of words like traffico, <coughs> circulazione, um, condotta, because these were words people used to talk about that sort of the promise of movement um, before they had the word infrastructure. But one of the ways to periodize is to, would be, a small question I had also was, and you could just answer yes or no, was water conceived as abundant or not? Like, was there too? In your case, yeah. you said there was too much flooding, but does that mean that water itself is like a thing? Commodity was it conceived as too much water, or no? Because that would be a way to. Yeah. Um, that that's very contemporary. Yes. Environmental thinking. Right? Yeah. Yes. Where's water? Is there not water? Yeah. And, and in your case, it seems like you didn't talk about the sacredness of water. There's anyways you have water and slope, so that's easy in a way. Like it doesn't seem like. Water well, no, water, water is very very sacred. So again, another thing I just couldn't put in there, but it, it's seen as really, you know, like it's 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 the circulation of life. It's a it's a problem when the Spanish come over and there's this view that rivers are dirty and they hold disease. Right. Mm -hmm. And for Andean peoples, they're they're like your blood vessels. I mean, they're veins, right? This is how the 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 universe uh, functions is because of the flow of water. Um, but but I would say in the Andes, whoa, water's scarce. I mean, right. the driest desert in the world is in northern Chile. Um, most of the communities that all live on the coast, they live next to rivers that are from melting glaciers. Uh, Peru is one of the most hardest hit and will be the most devastated by climate change because of the tremendous melting glaciers. And so um, I'd say there's a for the whole western slope of the Andes, which is where the Incas primarily were, um, there is a, a tight focus on water because of its importance. And right. even when you have the rain, you want to harvest it. And that's why those having those percolation right. systems are so key. Okay. Okay. So do you want to feel the questions? Or, I know my neighbor has a question. Raise your hand if you had a question. Well, I had a question about agriculture, mm -hmm. and I think Stella um, mostly answered a little bit, and we'll come, we'll come in more uh, mm -hmm. on that. Because uh, it struck me as you completed your talks that there are, you, you both talk about digging for infrastructure, mm -hmm. and there are allusions to digging for gold. Mm -hmm. um, what didn't get mentioned as much, at least in this mm -hmm. iteration of your work, is digging for agriculture. Mm -hmm. And I have very much political economy mm -hmm. in my mind because I'm teaching a class on political mm -hmm. economy. So we're reading all these British things about where the digging for um, agriculture is contrasted with digging for gold. Mm -hmm. And this is another kind of digging, mm -hmm. digging for Water. infrastructure. Of course, you know, those things are important in political mm -hmm. questions because it has all sorts of implications for how do you collect the taxes? It, it actually it's that pr process that makes mm -hmm. that thing we call the state, right? How you know is it revenue, land revenue that you collect these taxes or something? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to hear. Um, I mean, when you talked about that text, it sounded like a very early uh, text on political economy, mm -hmm. and I was a bit surprised that I mean maybe there's more there about agriculture, <coughs> but that other kind of digging, that uh, how it might relate to. Mm -hmm. 
um, of the commerce yeah. and gold. Yeah, fabulous. Um, so many thoughts. <laughs> um, yes, it, this to me is a sort of nascent discourse in political economy, absolutely. And I think this gets codified with uh, in, in the late 1580s with Giovanni Botero. I think like the tradition sort of takes off after that. Um, and in terms of agriculture versus gold, um, at least in the period that I'm studying, the sort of big contrast that's often drawn is, is it is it better to um, sort of find gold locally? Do you get richer from doing that? Or do you get richer from sort of trading? Um, and Giovanni Botero um, would also, uh, there's a beautiful article also by Vera Keller um, about this analogy that is in Botero's texts and in the texts of a lot of his readers um, about the sort of contrast, that, that contrast. And um, what he says is that some markets are the same thing as mines above ground because it's trade is like a mine that is above the ground it yields more, uh, or the same or more wealth than it would if you were to sort of just dig in your land. Um, agriculture is um, obviously another fount of wealth, according to some thinkers. Um, and it's sort of, I think in the context I'm looking at, um, a lot of the reclamation projects are geared toward um, producing more land to grow grain. There's fears um, in the late 1590s about famine um, uh, sorry, early 1590s and late 1590s about famine in Tuscany. And so the concern becomes about growing more grain, but also having more efficient transit routes to move that grain around to places that um, could not produce it locally. Um, but I think it, I don't know if there's one, I wouldn't say that there's one sort of dominant view. I think it depends on the different thinkers and I'm discovering this more. So whereas, whereas most people think um, swamps are bad uh, and they want to um, bonificate, <laughs> they want to uh, drain, um, I've encountered one thinker who's actually um, a proponent of a more sort of diversified farming system mm -hmm. um, around a marsh that mm -hmm. in incorporates pesca culture and sort of I'm writing a paper about that now. Uh, but I was really astonished to see this because most of the thinkers I look at are pro-drainage um, and this is sort of the way they try to appeal to, to the Duke um, because they think that sort of agriculture is what they want. And this, what, what the last thing I'll say on this is, at least in the Italian context, this I think goes back to, to um, sort of an ancient um, contest between um, agriculture and commerce too. So gold, I'm just going to say is like a, in my, in this formulation, like a proxy for agriculture, perhaps mm -hmm. digging awesome. and mining is not really uh, something I'm as familiar with in the Tuscan context, although there was uh, a lot of two from mines and I have a colleague working on this now. Um, but um, this sort of contrast between like, is it better for all, all of us to just be these leisurely, um, nobles with our villa estates and so on is that sort of the best way to wealth or should we be merchants in the city and trading um and so that's the the sort of contest that's invoked sometimes among these thinkers too but it goes back to ancient rome if not earlier yeah mm -hmm. and there are, sorry they wait there thank you both for such uh, fascinating talks um i wanted to point to kind of the shared vocabulary between the, the two of you, which is one of uh, imagining, mapping, visualizing power. Um, and Caroline, I, I really like your, your response to one of the comments about here that this is not like a, a high modernist Jim Scott kind of legibility mapping of like making, drawing maps, but actually a bureaucracy and kind of like a, a much more, um, yeah, a, a governance of, of, of sorts. Um, there's a question, or my question then relates to uh, the issue of water within you know, visualizing. Um, and there's a, a key question that Atea also you know, uh, hinted at uh, by like, these are long term projects, but there's also a different kind of temporality that comes mm -hmm. with water a temporality of seasonal uh, mm -hmm. shifts, of, of daily water flows, um, of flooding, kind of these accidental uh, shifts. Um, was there, or can you can you talk a little bit more about how these uh, temporalities of water actually uh, intervened and changed patterns of governance and pro uh, provided opportunities, but also problems to governance mm -hmm. of, of people? Okay, um, great question. But I would say, for on a, on a on a functional level, what we see is the Incas planning for those things. 
So again, like what Janet uh, Shearbody found in Cusco is they're actually making these reservoirs so that they can hold a lot of uh, water in the evening so that the, the canals never have to stop. Um, and also um, what um, uh, uh, Kenneth Wright and his wife, uh, Ruth White, they're the Wright water engineers, they've done all this amazing work at Machu Picchu is uh, similar where you see that there is a, a plan I mentioned how they actually it's like 80 gallons of water per minute, like way more than your average rainfall um, that they're they're actually planning for and they've got to prevent this overflow. So the terraces can, do slope down so you could have a little bit of runoff, but that's where your topsoil is. You really don't want to ever have that. So they, they are always planning for like when we have very little water flow and then where we have excess. Now, but because you've got these utter, underground uh, water systems and they're from melting glaciers, there is a annual renewal of that. Again, this is what climate change is threatening. So um, unlike um, like living away from one of these rivers where you're really dependent then on rain, um, these are all related to these somewhat consistent access of water, though different rates of flow, and they're uh, planning for those. Did that answer that question? Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the question. Um, temporality is, um, I think, really important to think about. Um, the evidence I've seen in my sources um, in terms of how the government is responding to sort of seasonality, that's sort of what you're getting at. Um, two, two examples jump to mind. Um, first, the in the same way that um, has Stella narrated um, the Inca conscripted um, non Inca mm -hmm. in, in our in this case of Tuscany it was um, the ducal government conscripted peasants to um, show up on certain days to um, reembank rivers that sort of needed their le levees repaired for example and they had to show up with their shovels and dig or sort of help cart um, stone and sand with animals. And this happened in the summertime, and it was something that people complained about. Some administrators said it was unfair because this was um, the harvest. But it happened in the summer because the fall um, was the rainy season. And so starting in like August, November, uh, sorry, August, September, November, um, especially November, you had really heavy rains, and that's when um, a lot of the, the flooding would occur. And so this was done in an effort to ensure that the, the levees could be re-embanked before um, before that happened, and also because many um, many watercourses, if they were called uh, torrents, that, that's word in English today, it's sort of, we imagine it as sort of um, aggressively rushing water, but in, in Italian, the word um, just refers to rivers that are not stable from year to year, or from season to season, rather. So a torrent in the summer would often be dry. And so that's also why these projects were more efficient to do in the summer, because in some cases, the water would be not there or very, very low. Um, so that's it, the season, the season cycle, seasonality cycles that um, sort of come to mind first. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I can think of at the moment. So Nikolai and then Lauren. Thank you both so much for your presentations. Um, I think in a way to connect Atreya's temporality in Zeynep's political economy, uh, my question is for Carolyn mostly, uh, what's in it for these protectors? Um, it not truly, I mean, it seems maybe a facetious question, but from my understanding, like the, the main case that you explore is a treasure. So these are people that are in some way uh, entrenched within the government or like a, the higher end of the society, probably have intimate connections. Mm -hmm. And these are, at least from the framework that I got, non-expert experts. Yep. These are people that are external to how to deal with these design problems mm -hmm. and thinking of it in long term, like the actual, what I would imagine in this project, how long it will take and the finances for it, it will take a long time. It will take forces beyond just one individual. Yes. Yeah. So what is, are they, is this a, I just know better than everyone else kind of uh, engagement they're looking for, or they just trying to get their name attached to it? And I guess so much secondary question to it is, we have this field of projectors. Mm -hmm. What was their efficacy rate? How did they actually have any influence with, mm -hmm. uh, in relation to these proposals? Yeah. Thank you for those questions. Great questions. Um, as for what the projector, what was in it for the projectors, um, money and fame. Uh, so there's, <laughs> I mean, to put it simply, but um, you're right, these were already figures with some degree of, of sort of clout within the wider ducal circles. 
which were themselves very hierarchical. And so it was about social climbing to get closer to the Duke, to get more money, to get some sort of permanent position where they could get sort of a stipend um, and also perhaps have a stipend for their families and progeny. Um, that, was this, that was what was at stake. And this um, sort of patronage culture has been um, written about extensively, not in this context, but one sort of study, if you're interested, Mario um, Biagioli has written about Galileo sort of operating in the court circles and the sort of importance of patronage in the sciences, in the, in the natural sciences and in astronomy. Um, the same thing I, I say is, is going on here. Um, the, uh, some of these figures, um, so Willem de Rat, I mean, I found um, three copies of a contract um, that he signed and that the Duke did not, but it was sort of like open, ready for his signature. But what was promised there was, um, I, I'm not remembering the exact sums, but, but exorbitant amounts of money for his sons and grandsons and grandsons and grandsons, you know. So that, that's really interesting. And it was um, this audacious project that did not happen. Um, the hit rate for projectors. Well, the funny thing about projectors is if it happened, we don't call them projectors, we call them, we call them engineers. Um, so, <laughs> um, the, so the Canal uh, Canale de Navicelli is, is a canal that still exists today. It's about 20 kilometers between um, Pisa and Livorno. So there was a canal that started to be built there in stages um, in the late 1570s. And I haven't gotten to sort of look at the construction documents for that yet, but that's that's a hope of mine. Um, but I haven't also found sort of project documents for that yet either. Um, most of them are for these, again, the Arno was very, very key because you had to sort of take things off um, boats and put them onto smaller or bigger boats, depending on if you were getting closer to Florence or further away at various stages. And that was just this arduous task that people wanted to obviate. Um, but the, the Canale de Navicelli is like the main and the biggest canal I can sort of think about that actually sort of was realized. And, and that's a modestly sized canal, but was still really important. Uh, it kept flooding though until like, in the seven, I mean, so these things are, are ongoing and even marsh drainage, you have to sort of constantly make sure that the, the borders are sort of um, refortified and, and that there's always some sort of um, outflow of, of swamp waters because they will just flood again. Mm -hmm. well. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to get back to the question of uh, agriculture versus commerce in this period because what I appreciate about where you end the paper is by kind of revealing what the larger geopolitical backdrop is for these internal developments and the turn from the state to the territory, which if I got this right, you said it was the foreclosure of a transnational economy because of the Spaniards. And as you know, this is kind of very similar also to what happens in the Venetian Republic at the time, that the maritime economy also falters mm -hmm. because it loses colony. And there too, you have kind of an explosion of basically land reclamation projects. Mm -hmm. So I had a question of A, what is the role of, say, expertise that's gained during a period of kind of intense maritime trade that, that maybe gets channeled into agricultural cultivation improvement? What do you see as being the similarities and differences between, say, the Tuscan region and the Vento vis-a-vis land reclamation? And is there also any kind of translation of expertise happening between these two contexts that seem to share very similar material conditions at this time? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, I, I pointed to this foreclosure of um, any sort of Tuscan imperialism, but I will say that, um, there were many ambitions and hopes. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the reign of Ferdinando I in 1609, um, he, he died in 1609, but in the years before his death, there was actually a voyage to what is now Brazil. Um, and they brought like a handful of, of Tuscans in the attempt to build a colony there. And that he died and then the project was scrapped. So, um, there was sort of like one um, expansionist ambition that sort of reared its head at the end of his, his rule. But during Ferdinando, uh, Francesco's reign, the, 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 his, his predecessor was much more internalist. I think your, the connection you're drawing between Venice and Tuscany are uh, very, very similar. Um, Venice was trying to sort of uh, rid itself of Spanish influence and uh, very um, sort of what really wanting to retain its independence um the technical links between these um these settings are ones that i have not really found um, tons of evidence of um, i found evidence actually of tuscan engineers going to other northern italian states or being sort of requested by other rulers and the, the medici princes had to sort of say you know you can only go for three months or something because we need you back here so that's happening a bit in the 17th century 
Um, there would be some Northern European engineers um, like from the Low Countries who were in Venice and who also came down to Tuscany. Um, but I um, am look, on the lookout for some of these connections. I haven't really seen, seen some of them. And then you asked about expertise in overseas expansion and how that plays in. Do you mean like navig like whether sort of like navigational yeah, knowledge? Yeah, knowledge about kind of like uh, ships. Huh, yeah, I, I haven't thought about that. Um, it's a great it's a great question. I I am trying to find out more about river boats, um, yeah. and I haven't really found much, unfortunately. Um, but that's sort of one question I have about like navigating rivers versus navigating on the seas. Mm -hmm. I think they were very different, and mm -hmm. um, that's sort of my impression. Um, there's been tons of scholarship, of course, on um, seafaring um, that I'm not really looking at at the moment, but um, I, I probably should. Um, and Amora gets our final question. Sure. Um, so my question relates to the topic of um, preservation and how we're thinking about yeah, the anthropological discourse and water futures. And I was thinking how the monument typically um, as an occupiable or relatively occupiable space differs from something like the ruins, which you mm -hmm. mentioned, um, which is highly regulated, often um, archaeological. And so for context, I was thinking of the different ways that movement is regulated, like you mentioned Machu Picchu mm -hmm. versus what you would see in the process of the Sacred Valley. Mm -hmm. um, and in your book, you discuss uh, the theatrical use of space mm -hmm. um, by the Incas in Chincharo and other places in the mm -hmm. Andes. But um, I think you mentioned you consider how architectural space creates and articulates this movement, which you both spoke to a bit. Um, and this is sort of a two part question, feel free to answer either, either or both. <laughs> but um, essentially, how preservation in these communities, um, colonial, imperial communities in particular, um, navigate this importance of protecting history. Um, that's been the efforts have been to erase it um, versus sort of this opportunity to break away from your Eurocentric ideas of preservation, like in the situation of UNESCO heritage sites that often isolate architecture um, and artifacts from the community and context. Um, and is it, you know, is there a value or is there an interest in sort of revitalizing or reoccupying some of these spaces and canals um, in their sort of continued use? Um, or is there, you know, is it think of it? Um, great question and very, very uh, pertinent to what's going on in the Andes as well as a lot of indigenous communities. Um, preservation is one of the new um, ways of dispossessing indigenous peoples from their lands, right? I mean, everyone goes to Machu Picchu and doesn't think about all the indigenous people that were removed from that park to make that archaeological zone. Since I've been working at Chinchero, um, the community has lost more and more and more of its lands um, because they are seen as damaging it. Um, and yet conservation efforts often fix up sites so that tourists will like them. I mean, tourist dollars are really, really important. And so there's far more destruction that happens, even though it goes, that goes against sort of like UNESCO codes of what you're supposed to do to sites, they are heavily redone to please tourists. Um, so conservation is a very um, complicated, often not involving indigenous peoples um, project. And um, it's a huge topic, right? Um, I mean, like what I'd say, like to give an example, also back to Chinchero and how it impacts land and water. So they have now decided to build an airport next to Chinchero and the lake. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea about that's okay, um, we'll just put a little fence around Chinchero and it's all gonna be good. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's like building an airport in the in, in Versailles backyard, right? Like th this is a huge estate. It's incredibly nuanced in, in, in its relationship. The ecosystem is really critical the airport is well underway to its construction and it's to bring in tourists who don't like to do the long trip from the current Cusco airport, among other reasons. Um, but, you know, you look at communities like Taos, um, which own the tourism, right? They decide who gets in, um, what those tourists can and can't do. Um, there's, there's definitely models in which indigenous people um, can and should have control over those landscapes, which goes back to your point about um, issues of ruins, right? Like um, a lot of these, when I started working in Chinchero, several of the wakas were 
considered to be still alive. People still made offerings to them. They had communications with them. I remember I was working in Bolivia and I was gonna measure some stones at uh, one of these urban parks and we were asked by a, uh, an indigenous uh, religious specialist to leave because he had to talk to them. You know, that, that it's about perspective, right? About what is ruined and what is still alive. And we see that right with the museum situation in the US with uh, native objects in museums and how important it is for those communities not only to have them back, but that they be treated um, in a certain way because they are seen as, as they're not relics of the past, but they're active agents today. Um, did, I, did I get that? I feel like there was a second part to that. Yeah. Well, yeah. They're not, you know, the irrigation and canals, those things can be. Oh, yes. Yeah. So just quickly on that, there, there has been a big effort for several decades um, to, to clean these canals. Many of the indigenous communities have kept them going, but particularly ones that have been in archaeological sites. Um, haven't been because they're not with the community anymore. They haven't been of their upkeep. And it's amazing um, the ones that are have been either maintained or been put back into use, how effective they are. And this goes, you know, one of the things that made the Incas so effective is, you know, when they would go into a new area and they'd see something that that community was doing, they'd pull it into their practices. So you see massive, wonderful irrigation systems across the Andes. There's project going on in the North Coast. Um, all of those, you see the sophistication really of hydraulic engineering in the Andes across the board. And so, yes, they are, they are um, still effective today and, you know, would be a way for the future if it wasn't for the melting glaciers, which is the source of so much of the water. Okay, I'm not uh, expert, but somewhat saddening note. <laughs> um, I mean, it's really incredible. I was putting together my introduction thinking what is, how do we conceive of water and it's so complicated but there is something between uh, what you were saying why is marshland this policing the marshland means policing what is uh, water and what is land and the more modern forms of land development or that you quote unquote reclaim land from water that any water can potentially become land but i think what you've shown is that this very gesture of being able to say that's inside and that's outside. Mm -hmm. if, if there's water inside, then it's one thing. If there's not water incorporated, then it's completely other. Mm -hmm. That gives us a kind of theorization, so I'm satisfied. But also, thank you so much for uh, incredible papers. Thank you, Atia, for a uh, super insightful response and to the whole crowd for coming. Um, thank you.